Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Mark, the TEA. We also have Lori and Betty, the TEA. You guys want to say hi? Hi, this is Lori. Hi, this is Betty. Um, and we are uh, probably going to give folks another one or two minutes here to uh, to join. Um, hopefully on your screen it says data entry refresher 2019. Um, let's check that. So we will, um, yeah, it does. Uh, so we will uh, do that. Um, and uh, yeah, be starting here just in a couple of minutes. All right, everyone, we are back and we were uh, going to go ahead and go through. I do see that uh, some folks have already found the, the questions box. As we go along, you can uh, feel free if you do have questions uh, to type them in there. And we will, um, uh, if we don't don't have a chance to get to them live, we will uh, take a look at them and uh, get back with you all on an FAQ. We did a previous one of these uh, back in August uh, before the September uh, reporting deadline and and similarly generated an FAQ out of it. So um, without any further ado, let's go ahead and move along. There we go. Um, so our purpose today is to provide some instruction on necessary data reporting tasks that y'all can be working on right now. Uh, we recognize that August is a really big season uh, going into September 15th, really big, uh, a busy time. And not only do y'all have a lot of things going on, but we also recognize that sometimes our system can get overloaded. And so we wanted to just provide a little bit of a refresher of stuff that you can be doing right now in, in ASAP. Um, also, we'll you know point towards some resources and, and uh, additional folks that you can talk with to help make that happen. Um, and, and as we mentioned a little bit, uh, to be gathering any additional questions uh, to help populate an FAQ. So what we'll be looking at doing today is uh, we're going to focus on three things and then have a little bit of time for updates. So those three things are going to be um, admissions, because right now you as an EPP may be, in fact, admitting candidates, formally admitting candidates. Um, we're going to look at the finisher records list because right now your candidates might be, you know, uh, doing some things that could allow you to update there. And finally, we're going to look at observations. And, and then there at the end, we've got a few updates for y'all. And I, I do think we've got some interesting updates. So uh, just a little bit of a reminder, the reporting year, um, there's a lot of other things that uh, happen throughout your year. And I know there's a lot of things that happen throughout our year, but um, just kind of pulled this together to kind of think about, so we had, 9-15-2018, that was, you know, uh, the, the ASAP data was locked down in ECOS. We had a review period where we here at TEA went through the data. Um, your program specialist shot you back a very nice um, letter telling you about um, any problems that were in the data. We popped open uh, ASAP for um, a week or two weeks that first time. Um, a week or two weeks that first time and uh, um, allowed y'all time to to make edits again after that locked it down uh, reviewed the data sent you additional guidance opened it back up uh, allowed you to make those final corrections and then locked it down again um, I believe it was 11 19 uh, that we we shut that down now I know in December late November December that uh, 
EPPs had some tasks that they needed to handle for Title II. Um, and uh, so now it's kind of January and February. And uh, we, we really do hope to be able to provide guidance so that, you know, if you have uh, any uh, time to be working on these pieces, that there's, uh, you know, that you're supported from the, the TEA as you're working on these pieces. One thing that I would like to forecast for you, we are uh, hoping to shoot out some some data updates, some sort of state of where y'all uh, are um, on 3-1 or on or about 3-1 2019. Uh, this would include, uh, you know, what observations we see in the system, who's been at it, who you've added as a newly admitted candidates, uh, what, um, and, and those types of pieces of information, just so you're able to, you know, uh, put those with your own records. Um, following that, I know that in April is a really busy Title II season. We go through May and June and July and August. Lots of stuff going on. August, of course, building back towards uh, the reporting uh, reporting that'll be due 9-15-2019. So just trying to take a little bit of advantage of those yellow months right now. Did have a question come in. Will you send us the webinar PowerPoint as well? I believe if you... Uh, um, if you registered for this PowerPoint, you will be able to get a hold of it afterwards. We'll, we'll post it there. Um, so question is, what should I be doing right now? Um, or what might I be doing right now in order to stay on top of my ASAP data? So as we mentioned a little bit, uh, entering all admitted candidates, and this is formally admitted candidates, into that test approval screen within seven days of their formal admission. Um, so that's something that needs to be happening throughout the course of the academic year. If your EPP, um, you know, admits people on a rolling basis, or if you've got some some big batches of admits that happen, um, you need to make sure that you're uh, getting those admitted candidates into that test approval screen, which is where you currently tell uh, TEA that you've admitted that candidate um, within seven days of the formal admission. Second thing that you could be doing right now is updating candidate statuses. So um, I know that uh, at least I saw this past year, um, as we got close to the uh, to, to the 915 deadline, some folks noted that there were a bunch of folks, a bunch of candidates on their other enrolled list who were no longer enrolled, and they were having to, you know, really do a whole bunch of other enrolled uh, removal and uh, other enrolled list cleanup uh, there and, and on a pretty tight timeline. So. Um, really encouraging that y'all right now go through that other enrolled list and if folks aren't, you know. Um, second thing about candidate status is you could be updating cert, uh, cert fields if your candidates are changing what they're pursuing. So, you know, they were pursuing math 712 and now they want to switch and pursue science 712. You can be doing that updating uh, right now so that you're not stuck doing it. Uh, on a really tight timeline uh, at the end of August and early September. And finally, uh, around that candidate statuses, you can be adding cert fields. Uh, so if a candidate, you know, was doing uh, Math 712 and now wants to add, do Math 712 and Science 712, uh, you can add that certificate uh, into that candidate status and be doing that work right now. Uh, additionally, uh, programs should be entering all observations that happened during the 1819 reporting year. So all of those uh, observations, even if your person isn't going to finish, uh, if the observation occurred in 1819, it needs to be reported in 1819. Um, that was a, we had a little bit of question around that last year, but if, if you do an observation in the academic year, it needs to be entered in the academic year. Um, finally, two more, uh, you can populate your local GPA spreadsheet with your admitted candidates. Um, so uh, that is, you know, to allow you to, to not have to rush there at the very end. And um, also you can be tracking your number of applied candidates. Uh, if you remember, programs do need to tell us, uh, do, y'all do need to report to us the number of candidates who applied uh, in your APR. And so however tracking of that that you need to be doing. Um, uh, we will, uh, we're, we're about to talk a whole bunch I see a number of questions coming in about bits and pieces of this. We're about to talk a whole bunch about every single one of these. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look. So first, we're going to start and talk about test approval. We're here. So currently, um, as I mentioned, EPPs communicate candidate admission to their program by entering information on the test approval screen. 
Um, this can be done individually, or this can be done as part of a bulk upload. And the things that you'll need for that, uh, for, for that is if you're gonna do the bulk upload, you'll need the social security number. Um, you'll also need the TEA ID, or the TEA ID rather. Um, candidate name, birth date, email address, the formal admission date, the route, and the test code. We did have a question just come in. If it, if it's a um, if it's another test, but it's on the same admission for this test approval, you need to use the same admit uh, admittance date uh, in that screen. Um, so again, if you've got additional tests that you want to add for that person, my candidate, you know, they were pursuing math and now they're adding science, and I need to approve them to take the the science test or they, they took their subject matter tests and now if I wanna give them uh, approval for the PPR, I need to use that same original admittance date. All right, let's take a look. I think that I got a little bit of a video. Now I'm not exactly sure what's gonna happen with my audio here. So I, I, I do ask you to all kinda to stick with us on this is that what this video is gonna do, it's gonna kinda walk through some stuff I might pause it as we're going to explain anything, um, but let's see, I think that I might be able to just do it if I say that. Let's see what happens really. So, yeah, there we go. So this is uh, what it looks like once I've logged in to Ecos, right? So I've got my uh, username and password and I've logged in to Ecos. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a add a test approval. So you can see I've got my green screen here, and I'm going to click on test approval, and then search add applicant. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding one person uh, at a time. So that I'm first we're going to show what it looks like to add one person. So. What I'm going to need is if you've got the TEA ID number, you would just skip straight to TEA ID. But if you don't have a TEA ID, if that candidate doesn't have a TEA ID number yet, you can get them one using their social security number. So there we're choosing to create with a given SSN. And if you're creating it, uh, creating that TEA ID number, you're going to need to enter all the information about the candidate. And it's really important here to make sure that you're entering the information uh, about the candidate from a valid driver's license or uh, a legal document there. So you make sure you're getting everything right and it will be the same uh, across different platforms. So once you have all that, you're gonna go ahead and add your new applicant. Now, once they're in there, uh, you can see that you'll also need now to add a test approval to let them know that you're what they're pursuing and that they're in your system and associated with you. So there we've got the formal date of admittance Again, that's the that's when the candidate has a accepted admission. You're going to select the correct route um, associated with this with this person. Um, the test you're going to choose a, a test for, that they would be pursuing. Um, that's part of the certificate that they're pursuing. And then for the approval, right now, if you're just uh, putting them in there, you can leave them as eligible, right? So eligible means they, they can't go out and register and take the test. Uh, it, uh, it just lets us know and kind of lets everybody know that this candidate here is uh, pursuing a certificate that would require the DANCE 612 and that they're pursuing it on their route code is ACP without prep. So leaving them eligible there. Once you got all that in, again, uh, you're gonna go ahead and click save and they should be there. And there you can see, you can review your work. So the second way, um, the second way that uh, you can put them in there, there is uh, to upload as part of a bulk upload. And you can see here that, uh, hold on, let's get there. Uh, you can see that this uh, tells you what are the variable fields that need to go in your, in your, uh, your CSV. You're gonna have to create a CSV file and you'll have these different variables in there. And uh, there's some guidance on this screen about, uh, about, there's guidance on the screen as to what needs to be in those different fields and what those different fields can have in them. Um, and, and just noting here that, you know, for all your classes of educators, you need to make sure you're putting them in here. So um, if it's a principal 
admit, if it's a counselor admit, you need to communicate to TEA that you've admitted them into that program, uh, again, using the same way currently. So um, this is an example of, I made a, a sample CSV here. Again, you can see I left, there's no header row in my CSV. It's important that you don't have a, um, a header row with variable names on it. It's just the information that's going to go in there. And so that's my CSV that I created, and it's got the SSN and the name, the date of birth, the email address, uh, the admittance date, the route code, uh, the test code, and I put that zero for eligible. So now I choose the file and I hit upload. It says, are you sure? And it processes and gives me a verification code that it uploaded my file successfully. So I think that's all that we have here. I'll go to my next slide now. There we go. Um, one way that you can go ahead and making sure that you are reviewing who's on your test approval and linking to that GPA spreadsheet is uh, we recognize that all candidates on your GPA spreadsheet are going to need to be entered into test approval, right? So GPA spreadsheet is uh, at the end of the reporting year. You let us know everybody you admitted and a number of different uh, data points about them. And we go and look to make sure that we will that we see those folks on your GPA spreadsheet also in your test approval. They need to be in both places. One, you're communicating to us all that information about them on your GPA spreadsheet, and the other, you're communicating uh, to the online system that they're admitted there. So it's a, it's a great place for you to be able to test and, and verify that you're keeping these things, uh, that, that you're keeping all this going. So next I'll hand over to Lori to talk a little bit about the finisher records list. Hi, this is Lori. I'm going to talk a little bit about the finisher records list that is in ASEP. Just click. So all candidates, including your newly admitted candidates, must be entered onto the finisher records list. And the finisher records list is really one list that contains candidates with the status of other enrolled and candidates with the status of the finisher. You can filter this list to see only candidates with the status of other enrolled or only candidates who are finishers or you can select the all filter to see all candidates on the list. You will not be able to see candidates that you've removed from the list. So to determine whether a candidate should be identified as other enrolled or as a finisher, think about the candidate's status with your program. A candidate who is other enrolled is in process of completing program requirements. This could be a candidate who was admitted in a previous reporting year or a newly admitted candidate. The finisher is a candidate that has completed all program requirements. The status of finisher does not depend on whether a candidate has received a standard certificate or has passed certification exams. When you report candidates on this list at the end of the reporting year, you'll think about each candidate's status as of August 31st of the reporting year. All candidates that were not removed from your program during the reporting year will be assigned either a status of other enrolled or a status of finisher. Candidates may be uploaded onto this list either individually or through a bulk upload. You will need to know the candidate name, TEA ID number, CERT license ID route and status. All candidates in your EPP, in any class, that's teacher, principal, superintendent, counselor, etc., will have a place on this finisher records list. Okay, so now let's look at a video clip that shows how to upload candidates onto this list. Oops, Ooh. let me go back one. Maybe you gotta go back another one. Oh. Yeah. All right. All right, let's see if I can do this narration again. What did I say that I should jump to? Uh, do, 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 do. 
Um, and there did a question come in to um, verify around, you know, making sure that people are off your other enrolled list and, and is that required in that whole thing. So um, I would point you all back to uh, where you all signed an affidavit saying that your data is complete and uh, correct. Um, so maintaining a, a prop, uh, another enrolled list that only has people who are enrolled in your program is part of that maintaining and reporting data that is correct to TEA. So just wanted to, to remind you all of that and noted that that question came in. So we can take a look at, you got to play, maybe? Oh, well, it's grinding on it now. Sorry, give me a second here. I appreciate y'all staying with us through all this. Oh, well, maybe you'll do it. Well, oh, that's never what you want to see. Let's see what happens if we wait for it to respond. So while we're waiting for this screen to come up again, uh, there's another question. This question says, what about students that were formally admitted and then choose to withdraw? Would we have removed their testing permission? And the answer is yes. When someone's formally admitted, you're going to upload them within seven days, as Mark said earlier. And then if they withdraw or are asked to withdraw, you're going to go in and you're going to change their status on that test approval to removed. Uh, once that status is changed, you can still see that candidate on your maintained test list as removed, uh, but they will be officially, their test approval will be removed and they will indicate to us that they were Uh, the next question says, when will the all but clinical option be removed from the finisher records list? I do not have an answer for that. We don't use that option anymore. That was used a number of years ago. Um, it's not hurting anything. I haven't heard that it's going to be removed anytime soon, but that's a good question. So I would, it's, just it's, ignore it. It's a challenge for us to ask our... Um, uh, with with, uh, with our IT resources as they are, um, we always try to prioritize things that are necessary. But I do recognize that is um, that that option remains on there, and we do always ask you, please don't don't select it. I am just about to figure out, and let's go back to that one. Screen and monitor too. Is that what they see now? Um, oh, we're back. So, if we can get back to trying to narrate a video looking at the finisher records list. See, I don't want to skip ahead now because I'm scared that. Uh, so, you can just imagine Lori uh, again explaining all, all that uh, great content to you as we're going through here. And I think we'll about see it right about. Here. So here again, we've logged into ECOS um, using our, uh, uh, and we're on the green screen there. And here we'll uh, update this for one student. So I clicked on student search and selecting a TEA ID and looking them up. And you can see this brings up my student's record. This is student name, my favorite student. Um, and you can, at this point, this person needs to be added. So you can, you'll need to select the cert code that they're pursuing. Um, and then you'll select the reporting year, and then you'll select either other enrolled or finisher. This person is now, you know, I'm adding them to my other enrolled list, so I've selected other enrolled. Again, and I'll hit save here, and now this person will be added, has been added uh, to my list. The second way to go about doing this is to do it in bulk, so I will upload finishers. Again here, I'll need to create a CSV using the guidance that's on the screen. No header rows, just the just the content. Here's an example of what that looks like with the TEA ID, the name, student, uh, that code. And now I'm going to go ahead and select that it's going to be to the finishers list, the year I'm going to do it. I select the record. I upload it. I get the information and I get the verification uh, that it uploaded. 
So that is um, how we go about doing that within ECOS. Let's take a look. I'll turn it back over to Lori. Okay. So to efficiently manage the finisher records list, it is recommended that you update the list regularly. So if a candidate leaves your program, go ahead and remove them from the list. If you wait till the end of the year, you may not remember. So remove them, you know, as they leave. Hopefully they don't leave too often. Uh, when a candidate finishes the program, go ahead and update their status uh, on the finisher records list to finished. Uh, the third bullet says if a candidate changes the certificate they're pursuing, including the content area, update the finisher records list. So one thing I want to say here about this is the certificate sought by the candidate should be accurately identified here on this finisher records list, including any supplemental certificates that candidate might be seeking. The certificate area or areas identified for a candidate on, on this list should match the tests that are approved for them in test approval and should match any certificates that are recommended for that candidate. In other words, if a candidate enters your program and is pursuing math 7 through 12, we should see a test approval for the math 7 through 12 test um, or they should have passed the, you know, the PAC test for math 7 through 12. And if you put them on a probationary or an intern certificate, we should see math 7 through 12. So all of that should line up with um, what, what is listed for that candidate here on the finisher records list. If a candidate adds a certificate that they're pursuing, add another row to the candidate's record with the additional certificate. That's good. Okay, so to update the finisher records list, what you're going to do is you're going to go into your green screen and you're going to select maintain finishers from the ASAP drop down. You're going to filter your list to view the current year and other enrolled. From this this list you can select remove for a candidate that leaves or finisher for a candidate who finishes. So notice the highlighted areas on the screen. We filtered our list for 1819 and other enrolled and you can see in the status column on the right that the little arrow shows you that you have an active drop down in which you can change the status of your of your candidate. Remember once you've removed a candidate and saved your updates you will no longer be able to see that candidate on the finisher records list. If you remove someone by mistake, you will have to upload that individual again to place him or her back onto that list. To add a certificate or a certification code, you're going to use the student search in the ASAP dropdown to find the candidate and uh, then you're going to add the certificate by selecting the appropriate certificate from the drop down menu in the certification code column. And you can see an example of it here on the left. It is important that the finisher records list accurately depicts the status of candidates in your program. The other enrolled list will automatically roll over when a new year is opened in ASAP. So what that means is that anybody who was remaining on your other enrolled list from 2017-2018 rolled over and is now appearing on your 2018-19 other enrolled list. This could create a situation where candidate status updates may be overlooked. It is recommended that you take time to review the other enrolled list and make sure it's accurate. This should be done now and not at state reporting time. Consider creating a schedule to periodically review and update this list as necessary. Okay, so now I will turn it back over to Mark and Betty to talk about observations. 
Lord, you want to talk at all about, um, we've had a few questions here uh, about uh, when should I take somebody off the other enrolled list? When should I leave them on there? You want to uh, tell you what kind of guidance we have around there? Yes. Um, so when a candidate is leaves or is asked to leave your program at any point during the reporting year, not only are you going to remove that candidate status in test approval, as we talked about earlier, but you're also going to go on and remove them from the finisher records list. Uh, and that should be done when the candidate leaves your program. I think that we, um, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Lauren, but if, if they would have to be readmitted, you need to probably take them off the other enrolled list. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, they are, yes. Once they're removed, they if they request a transfer form and say, I'm out of here, I'm leaving, I'm transferring. Um, if, they, if they change their major and say, I no longer want to pursue being an educator, you know, I'm, I'm changing my major. If they leave your program, then they need to be removed. If the candidate then later on says, oh, just kidding, I really decided I didn't want to leave, I want to come back. You're going to have to, they're going to have to reapply, you're going to have to readmit them, you're going to have to upload them all over again with the new admission date and test approval, and you're going to have to put them back on to the finisher records list again. Thank you. So um, thanks so much for that, Lori. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about observations. Um, really, everybody's favorite topic, I think, is observation reporting. Um, so we're, we're here. Uh, Betty's here to keep me honest. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about those observations piece. So a little bit around the what are we talking about with observations? So programs need to report uh, the clinical and the intern or probationary uh, teacher observations. Those records have to have a field supervisor where that field supervisor is identified by TEAID, and that needs to be for every observation. Now, what you're going to need here is the field supervisor TEAID, uh, the field supervisor name if you're going to do the bulk upload, uh, some sort of comment that has no punctuation in it. We've learned about that. Uh, the observation date, date the observation happened. The observation duration, uh, we'll need that, I believe, in minutes. The beginning date of the assignment, so for a, a clinical teacher, this is the beginning of that assignment. For an intern or probationary, someone uh, someone who's serving an internship with which there's a certificate uh, that goes along with it, that assignment begin date would uh, be the um, effective date of the certificate, the assignment end date, and the assignment type. Um, now, I, I, I can't recommend this enough. Please input your observations as they occur throughout the year. Every observation that happens in the 1819 academic year needs to be reported in the 1819 academic year. And if you're reporting those as you go along, you're not going to be stuck at the end of the academic year, uh, you know, trying to figure out all these pieces and collect everything and put it all in there. Um, I've heard from programs that, you know, space this out, they schedule it, they do it weekly, um, and they, the end of the year comes and this, and observation reporting is no big deal for them because it's already all been done. They've been taking care of it while it's been going on. So really highly recommending inputting your observations throughout the course of the year. A few tips. Um, you're, uh, for, for the system to accept that observation, the candidate needs to be on your other enrolled list or on your finisher records list. And they need to be on your finisher records list with a status of either other enrolled or finisher. So if you don't have your person on the finisher records list yet, it's going to kick back your observations. So you need to make sure as we think about order of operations here, all the stuff that Lori just described about getting somebody on your uh, finisher records list needs to happen before you can enter their observations. Also, observations can only be added for an unlocked year. So even if your candidate has an assignment that overlaps over two reporting years, the observations must be reported in the reporting year in which they occur. So I've got a candidate, you know, we, we were off a little bit, their internship started in February right? It'll start tomorrow. 
Their internship started in February, which means it'll go February to February. I conducted two observations. I conducted an observation in February, an observation in March. So I'm in the 1819 reporting year. And then I conducted another observation in November of 2019. That'd be in the 1920 reporting year. That's fine. That person is not an exemption. That person will still be counted. You get credit for doing observations for that person, but you must enter the observations in the academic year in which they occurred. So for those two that occurred in 1819, I need to enter them by the, by, by the time the 1819 reporting year closes. Even though my candidate is not done with their internship until the next academic year, I conducted observations this year and I need to enter in those observations this year. Um, it's the same thing as, you know, you have to enter someone onto your other enrolled list before they're a finisher, even though they didn't finish your program. When they come into your program, you need to get them on that other enrolled list. Same thing here. It happened in this reporting year, so you must report it in this reporting year. Observations that occur in the reporting year get reported in the reporting year. I can say that a few more times too. Um, <laughs> oh my. Also, um, please do note that field supervisors need to be put into ECOS before you can um, have them be a field supervisor of record. So this is another thing that uh, people, uh, uh, folks might try uploading uh, a big file of observations into the system and it kicks back at them uh, because they don't have the field supervisor in there yet. So a little bit of order operations on that. Field supervisor goes in first if you've got a new field supervisor and then you can get the observations in there for them. So, a little bit about what this looks like. If I'm gonna add an observation individually, I'm gonna to go to the ASAP menu, select observations. I'm gonna put in my candidate's TEA ID number and I'm gonna hit add record. Then I'm gonna add my observation individually. I'm gonna select my, uh, my supervisor from the drop down menu. I'm gonna enter the observation duration, probably gonna use those little drop down arrows. I'm gonna select the assignment begin date from the pop-up calendar. Um, so this is, there should only be one assignment begin date for my candidate's assignment, right? So if I've got three observations for my candidate, the assignment itself, it started the same date. So we should see the same assignment begin date for all those observation records. Similarly, we should see the same thing for the assignment end date, same end date for all those records. You're also then gonna select the assignment type from the drop down list. Now there's a legend there uh, that tells you about what valid assignment types is what valid assignment types. And, and we recognize that this has been a pain point for, for, uh, for folks because uh, there's a, a little bit of confusion that list maybe isn't laid out the best way that it could be. Um, so what we've got here on the next slide and um, we're working on getting this into the system is a clarified list of what these assignment types mean. So um, Betty and Lori worked on putting this together and this is uh, uh, some, it's saying essentially the same stuff, but I think in a little bit of language that we're a little bit more comfortable with. So if your person's on an intern cert, they're either gonna be an INT1 or an INT2. That means they're serving an internship and they hold an intern cert. If they've got one assignment, it's an INT1. If they've got two assignments, it's an INT2. If they've got a probationary cert, so they're serving an internship with a probationary cert, and they're on a first year, we've got Pro 1, Pro 2. If they're on a second year of an internship and they have a probationary cert, we've got, based on if it was successful last year or unsuccessful last year, and how many assignments that they have, we've got those four options. If they're on, if they're serving an internship and they're on a probationary extension certificate, similarly, we've got, if, they're, if it was successful last year, unsuccessful last year, one assignment, two assignments, we've got options for that. 
And then finally, we've got the options for our clinical teachers. Clinical teachers, while they're being a clinical te teacher, should not have a cert. So we got into a little of this last year is that um, there was, we can put them in as clinical, but then it goes and it looks to see if they've got a cert or not. If you're putting them in as a clinical teacher, it should be folks who don't have a cert because they aren't doing an internship, they're doing clinical teaching. Anything else on that, you guys? Um, we will, like I said, put this out here and, and we'll work on trying to provide this additional guidance uh, to folks. So, as we mentioned, in addition to putting individual uh, observations in, you can use a bulk upload. If you're going to use a bulk upload, again, you're going to create a CSV file. That CSV file will not have a header row. It will just be the data, right? You'll need the supervisor last name and first name for this, then the beginning date of the assignment. And again, that can't be the future. You can't, can't be logging an observation for an assignment that hasn't begun yet. Then the candidate's TEA ID, candidate's last and first name, the observation date. That observation date has to be within this reporting year because every observation that occurs this reporting year, you report it this reporting year. Can't be in the future because you can't log an observation that hasn't happened yet. Um, observation duration, you're going to want to be very careful here with your CSV because if you create uh, your file in Excel as an Excel spreadsheet and then export it to a CSV. It's not going to export it to a CSV right if it's done a bunch of formatting stuff to it in Excel. So you need to be really careful after you create your CSV, open your CSV in a text editor to identify where there's any weirdness, where any automatic formatting has been put in and changed things. We get that frequently. I as supervisor comments, as we discussed previously, um, uh, that comments field can't have punctuation in it. So most of our programs that I see that are uploading these things successfully usually put just like C folder or C file or satisfactory or, or, or something to that effect. Um, TEA does not currently use that data, the data that is in the supervisor comments box. Um, J for the supervisor, I, uh, TEA ID, the assignment type that we just looked at that list and the end date of the assignment. So in order to do that, you'll use in the ASAP menu, you'll click on upload observations. You'll select the observation log uh, from the upload file type. Uh, you'll use the choose file button to uh, select your file and hit upload. And then you'll want to check that upload. So you can click upload status, uh, select the upload in the upload type column and, and uh, look for errors in the upload results column and uh, review the observation logs for a sample of candidates to ensure that your upload was complete and accurate. All teacher observations, including observations for candidates on extended probationary certs, need to be reported in ECOS. So if the person is doing an internship, whatever cert that is associated with it, if they're doing an internship, you must enter their observation records into ECOS. I might not have mentioned this, so I, I really I really want to make sure that I, I, I do mention it. Observations conducted in 1819 have to be entered in ECOS in 1819. Um, and finally, internship observations need to need to happen while the cert is active. So it should occur between the effective date and the expiration date of the certificate that's associated with the internship. So if I have an effective date on my cert that is, you know, February 1st, the observation can't happen January 15th. It has to happen while my cert's active because that cert is associated with my internship. That's all the stuff I have for observations. I, I really, uh, Rec recognize and appreciate all the work that y'all do to get your observations into there. Um, I know that there was updates last year and we're, we all kind of continue uh, to work through the reporting on it. Um, and, uh, and so I just appreciate all the work uh, that's going on. Uh, some question about two assignments here. What does it mean with two assignments on that, on that list? Does, you want to hop in? Sure. So this is Lori. 
Uh, two assignments in a two assignment situation that would be, for example, if you have a candidate who is um, in an English language arts seven through 12 assignment and the campus requires them to also teach some social studies sections, they would also need then a social studies certificate. And so if you put them in English language arts and social studies, they'll need a, a, a probationary or an intern certificate for each assignment. And then you will need to provide supervision for both of those assignments. Um, an example of, of what wouldn't be two assignments, I don't think, and Mark can correct me here, is if a candidate is in core subjects EC6, um, but then has a bilingual supplemental, that would be one assignment, because we're talking about the, the base certificate, the actual content certificate. Absolutely. Um, so that a uh, number of people asked that absolutely that specific case was asked um so uh there was a question in here and and just to clarify report every observation it's not an exception if the person has an internship that falls across multiple reporting years. That is not an exception because what we do is we go and we gather up all the observations that were entered in the system and we count them up. Now that's why you need to enter the observations in the reporting year in which they occur. These people aren't exceptions. It's not, a, you still have to provide all these observations and provide these observation records if the person has uh, an internship that goes across two reporting years. You just need to report, just like you report when somebody goes out there enrolled, you report them in the year when it happens, not the year that they finish and exit your program. You report what happens in the reporting year during the reporting year. So I, to, I, I really do want to make that clear. It is not an exception if you, that a person has an internship that goes over, uh, goes across and, and has part of that in two reporting years. That's not an exception. What you need to do, though, is you need to report the observations in the year in which they occur. I'm looking for a few other. Um, a great question here. I had an intern that uh, essentially didn't complete their internship. Uh, certificate abandonment, um, was asked not to continue to keep coming to the school, whatever happens, right? Um, you need to communicate the um, that cert and uh, uh, to, uh, is it Carrie handles that list? Deactivations. Yeah, the deactivation list. So you need to communicate that cert, de that situation uh, to uh, program specialist Carrie Elsie, who puts it on the cert deactivation list, and we get that cert deactivated. Very important that the only way that we know to deactivate that cert is when you report these types of situations to us. Now, once we've got that cert deactivated, we can act, we access that cert deactivation list and we can pull them off your observation, uh, li the list of interns that you're responsible for having observations for. So we can do that if we've got it um, listed on our deactivation list. Also, um, you know, some folks sent us in exception letters around uh, the end of the year reporting time and we're able to, to make sense of it then. So, you know, if somebody is an exception, they, you know, they got halfway through and they left or they, you know, got seriously ill or uh, they moved away. All these types of things happen, right? And these are the types of things that we have exception lists and the deactivation list for. So want to take a look at some updates. So we do indeed have some updates. So um, a few people talked about uh, the 1819 GPA spreadsheet, that template will be posted soon. Um, there are not major overhauls uh, from the 1718 year. Um, the dates are changed. So we will go ahead and get that posted um, hopefully tomorrow, but it might be after the weekend. Um, as I noted, the only changes are on the dates. Now, uh, something that I, I would like to let you know is that as I mentioned previously, we plan to send lists of expected candidates uh, for the GPA spreadsheet. Um, that's a, a, a list of folks who are, uh, we have test admits, uh, that newly admitted folks. Um, we want to send that through, want to let you know so far who we're looking at. 
And then again, we'll plan on sending that uh, probably 9-7 because that's seven days after 9-1 um, for y'all to verify prior to that final submission. So an increase in we're working on getting data back to y'all um, more throughout the year and uh, and, um, and so that we can make that end of the year reporting happen more easily and more reviewed. So another change that I'd like to announce, and this is, you know, people ask us, well, what, what are we doing to make stuff better? So about about three quarters of our programs had issues last year with putting in information uh, in their APR. And I had a number of programs point out to me, hey, TEA, y'all already have this number. So we are, uh, we fix this. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to pull uh, the, we, we've you know, been able to invest the time and resources into uh, updating the back end of the system. So the admitted, retained, and completed numbers will be pulled from data that's already in our system. Um, we will, because it's not collected anywhere else, we will still have to get the applied numbers directly from programs. Their uh, statute says that we collect it and we post it, so we have to do it and there's no other place that we can go and index records and calculate that number. So this is an update that we've been able to take care of uh, and make this improvement for y'all. Uh, it was one that, um, you know, our program specialist estimated about three quarters of our programs that there was some issue with these numbers. So we have invested our res uh, some of our resources to take care of this. Um, so that's a thing that will be done. Um, we are also um, working towards uh, and actively working, like resources are currently working towards uh, making additional updates and improvements in the system. I know a lot of people ask us, there's there's fee money, where's this fee money going? So we fixed the way we've updated how the APR piece is going to work. Um, it also, uh, we're reporting a lot more data back to folks and bringing a lot more ASAP uh, pieces online. Um, and we are uh, working to make stuff better uh, for the future. So uh, we continue to do that, that updating work. Finally, just to let you know a little bit about additional resources. Um, you might uh, recognize your program specialist here, um, uh, Betty. I put your hand up. She's happy that I put uh, handles observation questions there to the extent that she can. Um, and, uh, and then, um, there's me, there's also uh, Dr. Tam Jones, uh, who is the Director of Educator Preparation. And um, here is the where the Program Provider Resources page is. As we mentioned a little bit ago, we will have the new GPA spreadsheet up there, um, the new GPA spreadsheet template rather up there. Um, and then uh, we will have uh, additional guidance that lands on the bottom of that Program Provider web page. We have a few minutes left, so uh, we're going to go through uh, and see if we can identify any questions uh, that we can answer. Hold on, let me make this a little bit bigger here. Um, all right, so we have, we talked about other enrolled questions. Um, uh, Catherine asked, do you foresee any change to the GPA spreadsheet template? As I mentioned, we do not, and we will get that new one posted, Laura. Um, again, maybe tomorrow, maybe early next week. It kind of depends on some internal IT processes. Um, uh, if you did not admit any candidates, you will just need to uh, make sure to keep that other enrolled and finisher stuff up to date. You will need to make sure to keep the um, test approval up to date. If a program didn't admit any candidates, uh, anything else they need to keep? Uh, Lori, you got, got something? Yeah, so um, if, you, if you didn't admit any candidates in any program, any class in your program at all during this year, if you're, you're sort of on hold for admitting candidates, then you're just gonna need to send us a letter at state reporting time and say, I don't have any new admits for this year for any of my programs. However, if you're admitting candidates, let's say in your teacher program, but you didn't admit any in your principal program, you may be approved for a principal program, but for whatever reason, you didn't admit anybody, then what we're gonna ask you to do 
do is you're going to go ahead and complete the GPA spreadsheet and submit it. You'll populate your teacher class with the teacher admits. But then on the principal tab, if you'll just type in on a one line there, no new admits for this reporting year. That way we won't email you back and say, uh, you're approved for a principal program, you forgot to report. We'll know it because you will have said on that tab, no new admits for this uh, class. Um, we got a few other questions here. If uh, I have a candidate who packed it in, in on my test approval, what should I put for the test since they already passed the PAP? The PPR, right? Yeah, so when you upload a new admit in test approval, um, even if they come in with a past test, you can still upload them as eligible for that same test. It, the system will allow it and it's not going to hurt anything uh, because they're just eligible. There would be no reason you would approve them for one attempt on a test they've already passed, but eligible is fine. You can also just upload them for the PPR because they'll eventually have to take that PPR anyway. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. Um, will it ever let us move candidates to other role uh, to finish your in bulk upload? That is one we are working on uh, with some IT resources. So thank you for that question. Um, as you might expect, some of these things do take time, but we are um, we're moving on a lot of different pieces right now, and really excited, um, hopefully, to uh, have a lot of updates following uh, this reporting year, so we can start next reporting year. Uh, that'd be the 1920 reporting year with some new structures. I'm doing a lot of work right now. Um, taking a look at a few more uh, questions. A student, maybe you can move them. Yes. Um, let's just keep looking. So again, if you're, if I think they just continue questions around uh, folks. When is it time to take them off the other enrolled list? When is it time to put them back on? Uh, we are, you know, if they're, if they've left the program, you need to want to leave. If they're taking a semester off, I think you can leave them on there. Yeah. So, um, if, if they're on your other enrolled list and, uh, they become inactive, but you still consider them enrolled, you're going to carry them on your other enrolled list if they're still enrolled. But if, if you're part of a structure, for example, in a university where they have a policy about candidates, if they miss, for example, two semesters and they have to withdraw from the university, you can't carry them on your other enrolled after that because they're no longer even enrolled in the university. So you need to really have a clean policy for when a candidate leaves your program. And if you have a clean admission policy and a clean exit policy, then it should always be clear to you who is in and who is out and if they're in they're on that list and if they're out they're off of that list and i think that you know we we think about that if, if they would be if they would have to be readmitted if they'd have to go back through an admission process uh to get back into you know uh working with your program then they, they should be removed from the list um and i think that uh so just you know try to as Lori stated the the clearer you have a policy the better if they would be allowed to, you know, if they'd be able, allowed to go and, you know, pursue certification with a, with a different EPP, if they're in that status, then they should, they shouldn't be on your other enrolled list anymore. Um, looking through a few more of these, um, we talked about if a candidate leaves their internship early. Um, if a candidate, oh, it's if it's a uh, supplemental cert, then that's just one assignment. We talked about one assignment versus two assignments. So student teaching seven weeks in two problems. So if someone's student teaching seven weeks in second grade and seven weeks in sixth grade, that's the assignment. That's one assignment. That's one assignment. All right. Um, And so, yep, and we're always working to get more data updates in. 
Um, oh, great question. When will there be an update at 1819 ASAP technical manual as well? Um, so uh, we do need to uh, update that manual based on the update to, you know, that we're removing the APR reporting. Um, uh, uh, we're removing that from y'all. Um, so uh, it's going to take us a little bit to update that manual, but I appreciate you being patient with us. I think we can we can target to try and have some additional guidance by 3-1 when we're sending out that more data. Um, and that is looks like all the time we have. I'm getting I'm getting waved off here. So that has all the time that we have uh, for you all today. Thank you so much for spending time with us, for logging in, and um, you know, listening, learning, asking your great questions. Um, we will work to gather those up and get an FAQ posted around these things. Um, I think that's a good thing to double check and all of that. Um, we can make sure that we check my math on anything that I might have said. Um, but again, we thank you for your continued work uh, throughout uh, throughout the year, and we do want to support you so that we're able to, you know, spread this uh, reporting work out over the course of the year um, instead of trying to make it all happen in two weeks at the beginning of September. So um, thanks, and uh, and have a good rest of your day. Yeah, this is Lori. Thanks, y'all, and give us a call if you need assistance or have additional questions. You know we're here to help.